the LiDAR concepts uh, come from the fact that in the 80s, LiDARs were quite bulky and difficult to operate. And because they were emerging market for measuring atmospheric environment, we thought that it was possible uh, to compact the LiDARs and make it easy to use. On the Sackley on Orsay campus, there are a lot of research centers dedicated to environmental monitoring and scientific studies, such as CEA, LATMOS, LMD or ONERA. So all the ingredients were there to build a new technology, a new scientific point of view on LiDARs. And at this time, the telecom markets were blooming. A lot of companies were developing lasers, detectors, fibers, and putting all these together, it was possible to build a new product based on these telecom components. The chance we had is that the lasers used in telecoms can be pulsed and so could be used for LiDARs. And the other chance was that the wavelength that is currently used in fiber transmissions is 1.5 is exactly a good wavelength to, um, transmit, to be transmitted in the atmosphere. And so we had the technology, we had the scientific background and we could build a new uh, LiDAR family. In the late 90s, I hired two PhD students, one working on the hardware of the LiDAR and one working on the software. And together, they built a first LiDAR based on telecom technology. It was quite huge. It was a, a room was needed to enclose the LiDAR. But we, we had the first uh, results at this time. Then we decided to compact the LiDARs and to put the lasers, the detectors, the telescope into racks. And the LiDAR was about one meter cube of size, but it was the first time that we put the LiDAR outside. Leosphere was funded in 2004 by Alexandre and Laurent Sauvage. Their first idea was to develop LiDARs for aerosol monitoring. And in 2006, Onera transferred the technology of coherent wind LiDARs. And because of the quick growth of wind energy, we were able to develop and build and sell our first LiDARs within two years. So in 2007, we sold our first LiDARs and in 2010, 100 LiDARs were operating around the world. These LiDARs, the wind cube LiDARs, were used to assess the wind on new sites for wind, new wind farms. And because uh, the LiDARs were able to replace the mast, a lot of customers used them and in 2016 more than 750 LiDARs are now operating around the world. Here is the WindCube, the star Doppler wind LiDAR of Leosphere. Thanks to its five laser beams, this virtual MET mast measures the horizontal and vertical wind speed and direction from 40 meters to 290 meters. Once the turbines are installed, a nacelle LiDAR can be an attractive alternative. Here is our wind iris, based on the same measurement principles, but looking horizontally. The wind iris can favorably replace the wind cube on offshore farms or on onshore complex terrain to get more information from different wind directions. The LiDAR can be used at any stage of the wind form life for reducing uncertainties through accurate wind and turbulence measurements. First, for wind resource assessment during the project development, then for power performance testing during the commissioning, and finally, during operation through performance monitoring and optimization of wind turbines. WindCube is an accurate as mast with a cup or sonic anemometers, provides wind data at 10 altitudes simultaneously, and ensures more than 95% of data availability at 150 meters, whatever the weather. The LiDAR can withstand harsh conditions from minus 30 degrees to plus 45 degrees and can virtually be installed anywhere. Here, for example, is an installation in Sweden 
by Aries, a UK renewable energy provider. The wind cube demonstrates a low consumption of only 45 watts, allowing the LiDAR to be supplied by a fuel cell or a solar panel for at least three months. Here is the image of a wind cube that was deployed by the Danish consultant Alpha Wind in the desert of Saudi Arabia for a 12 month period. In Europe, the wind cube is used mainly by wind developers and consultants to measure the wind profile at different places on a future wind farm over a full season and to derive the wind speed statistics. In other markets like USA and China, we see a stronger focus on performance testing in an operational use by asset managers. For example, as you can see on the top graphic, horizontal wind speed is measured at a given height and plotted versus time during three hours, showing the different time scales. A statistic analysis of this time series confirms the weighable distribution of the wind speed histogram. Let me explain the interest of a LiDAR in wind resource assessment. A MET mast is usually 60 or 80 meters high, corresponding to small turbines up height. So, consultants need to extrapolate vertically the horizontal wind to estimate it over the full disk of the rotor. As turbines grow higher and bigger, it's even worse, and the wind at up height cannot be measured directly. The extrapolation leads to more uncertainty in AEP estimation. The LiDAR range covers the full disk of next generation bin turbines, either future 6 to 10 megawatts. Moreover, the LiDAR doesn't need any calibration, while cup anemometers and vanes need a yearly calibration. Of course, a traceability to current practices is often required. That is why LiDARs and MAST are currently used together. But what is AAP? The AAP is the annual energy production, assuming 100% turbine availability. It represents an estimate of the total energy production of a wind turbine during a one-year period as calculated by applying the measured turbine power curve to a relay frequency distribution at a specified up height annual average wind speed. With a gain of 40% on AEP uncertainty and by the advantage of instrument mobility, the return on investment of a LiDAR is only 1.5 euros. It also brings strong reduction of total cost of ownership. A mast is fixed. A LiDAR is light, small, and can be easily deployed on site, especially on complex terrains. On a large future wind farm, as shown on the right, it's then possible to move the LiDAR, collecting data at the different points and during different seasons, and finally, to reduce the uncertainty due to the horizontal extrapolation of the wind profile. The LiDAR is not the only remote sensor used for wind energy. The SODAR is an alternative, using sonic waves instead of light waves. Even though cheaper, and more energy efficient, the SODAR is less accurate than the LiDAR, bigger in size, more sensitive to ambient noise, and so cannot be installed close to mass or buildings because of its large beams. Moreover, the SODAR needs a temperature correction on the post-processing filtering. LiDAR signal relies on backscatter on natural aerosols, and it is then proportional to the concentration of particles. But the extinction is also proportional to this concentration. So, when fog occurs, maximum range is then limited because of aerosol extinction. On the contrary, data availability can be reduced in very clear air conditions, such as Arctic atmosphere, because of the low aerosol concentration. Fortunately, 95% of atmospheric conditions give good wind speed measurements. The LiDAR availability is totally insensitive to bright sunshine, to distant clouds, and rainy conditions don't affect horizontal wind measurements. On the top figure, LiDAR wind data and cup data are plotted together, and time series are very close to each other. This good correlation is unchanged during the rain periods. 
However, concerning vertical wind speed, the bottom plot shows large vertical speed during the rain period coming from echoes on falling droplets. In flat terrains, the wind flow is assumed to be parallel to the ground above 40 meters. The wind reconstruction is accurate and the bias between the LiDAR and the mass is lower than 1%. As you can see with these graphics, the comparison plot between wind speed measured by capanometers and by LiDARs at 99 meter height is a perfect straight line with unitary slope. In complex terrains, such in Greece, the flow lines are not horizontal and simple reconstruction algorithms don't perform well with a bias from 3 to 7%. However, assumptions on terrain profile and roughness can be taken into account in efficient embedded algorithms to finally strongly reduce the velocity uncertainty from 6% down to 1% as you can see on the figure on the bottom right. Thank you for your attention.